I can go to the box. In the QR code, if you scan, will be access to the whole menu. Yes, you can eat, eat in here too. Thank you. Hello. All right. Thank you for bearing with us and we're going to get started now. It sounds like people online can hear us, which is great. Uh, we had an issue last month about that, so I apologize. But uh, welcome to the HME Tech. Did you hear for the trivia? Uh -oh. Oh. <laughs> Hello. Is it back? No. It is. It is. Yeah. It's kind of. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> All right, let's just, just try this one again. All right, um, so we're gonna be here for a community tech, hopefully. If not, trivia is somewhere else in the building. So uh, we might be in the wrong room. Um, but with that said, uh, my name is Hein Lamb. <laughs> Speak up to me. Oh, you please walk. Just put it up. I think we can hear it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, for those who don't know me, my name is Hein. I think catch up Dr. V. I am the host of AT New Tech uh, for the very last time. Um, for those of you who were here last month, I know that I will be moving on and we'll be bringing on the new co new hosts afterwards to introduce themselves. But uh, this will be my very last time hosting AT New Tech, which is bittersweet for me, but I'm really excited about the new guys who are going to be coming in to continue to lead AT New Tech forward. Um, so with that said, I know like some of you are probably going to be shedding some tears for me, but you don't need to. <laughs> um, we're going to do a quick poll. Um, let me get that started. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for making that off with me, Rich. Uh, so one of the reasons why AT New Tech was started and needs to go on is to not only showcase all the cool tech that's going on in Ann Arbor or around the state, but also to connect people who are just overall interested in, in tech. Um, and so we like to do a poll at the beginning to kind of see who is all involved in the community. Uh, so since we have the uh, hybrid model going on right now, the poll only really works for those who are on the Zoom. But I'm going to start it with them and then ask you all here to raise your hands afterwards to see which one of these uh, did you fall under. So our categories are entrepreneur, wanting to start a venture, investor, marketer, designer, software developer, and other. So go ahead and think about your options. I'm going to start for those online. We need to watch them answer, hopefully. No one wants to participate. Okay. 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 All right. Well, those online are do not want to participate with the poll. So, uh, those in the room, hopefully, you guys will raise your hand for the answers. So, I'll end that one. The result, results shockingly are zero. So, spoiler alert there. I'm sharing that. All right. So, for those who are in the room who are entrepreneurs, please raise your hand. Awesome. Good amount. Anyone here looking to start a venture? Cool. Hopefully you get inspired tonight. Any investors? Got a couple. Uh, anyone in marketing? Got a couple as well. Any designers? Do graphic design, UX design? And software developers? Okay, and the rest are others, I assume. All right. Cool. Well, uh, we're going to do some mingling and networking afterwards. So for those who are others, 
would be interested in knowing what you would have said. Uh, but with that, we'll go ahead and move things along. I can find my notes. So um, if this is uh, another way for you to connect with the community is with our Slack. You can join it by going to madeinA2.com slash Slack. Uh, it's a great place to kind of ask questions, announcements, things like that. So uh, feel free to jump in and join. Uh, for those who are new to this, the format's pretty straightforward. We have three awesome presentations tonight for you. Uh, they each have five minutes to present their startup. Afterwards, we'll do a five minute Q&A. Um, and then after these three presentations, we'll do community announcements. So if you have anything to announce, like if you are running a meetup or if you're looking to hire or whatever it may be, uh, think about your announcement. So you can come up after the presentations and announce them. Um, and then after that, we'll hang out and mingle. As I mentioned, you can grab drinks, food if you want to here. Um, okay, my part is coming to a close soon here. So thankfully, uh, we'll move on to the actual meet of the presentation, the meeting tonight. But before we do that, I want to quickly thank our sponsors, A2 Geeks, Roger Rails, who's helping me man uh, the machine over there, uh, Ann, Arbor, Ann Arbor Spark, the Entrepreneurship Clinic at U of M Law School, and of course, Forum for hosting us here at Venue. Uh, and with that, I'm going to bring up our first presenter, uh, Aaron of Quadratic. Quadratic is building a modern experience for reviewing job applications powered by AI. So uh, let's is Aaron here a welcome? Yes. So, is this working? This thing uh, scares me a little bit. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Aaron Kohler. I'm co founder of Quadratic. Uh, thank you. Okay, so uh, Quadratic is focused on uh, problem of application review. Uh, so in talking in, to people who are recruiters, talent managers, hiring managers, and in our own experience in being hiring managers ourselves, uh, we found that uh, there's way too much time and effort being spent on a very, very inefficient process, reviewing lots of applications. This is a screenshot uh, taken from a, a founder's actual uh, greenhouse. He's got 294 applications uh, pending his review. This isn't even a uh, particularly bad problem. I've seen and experienced much worse than that. Uh, so some of the reasons that this problem exists, one is that key info is locked inside PDFs. PDFs are basically unstructured documents, very hard to deal with the information contained in them. Uh, it's actually very hard to synthesize the signals from an application, especially if you're dealing with uh, high level professional talent. There's a lot of things you want to look for. Uh, mistakes are costly, we'll get to that in a second. And the other uh, piece here is that ATS software is not optimized for this problem, and it's not their focus. They do ATS do all sorts of things, and this is not the main thing that they're trying to uh, solve for. So our solution here is basically uh, to attack the problem head on by building a new way of reviewing applications uh, that uh, offers modern UX, uh, powerful tools, and custom automation uh, anytime you bring an automation to a very sensitive uh, decision process like this, it's very important to keep people in control. People are the ones that know what's important, especially with something uh, as critical as hiring. Um, and in no way do we want to remove that human element, but what we want to do is help people uh, perform their tasks uh, better and more quickly. So, uh, yeah, we're in the next slide here. All right, so this problem, of course, has existed for a long time. Sometimes I wonder why we even, uh, it's surprising we've even moved past paper uh, here, um, but why is it that we think we can solve this problem now? So one of the big reasons is that the new large language models that have been made available by OpenAI and, and soon other companies really are game changers. We found that we can do things with these models that are now available and, and fairly cheap that would have taken a really long time to do before. We found that we're able to deal with this unstructured data uh, in many ways better than uh, is possible uh, through some of the, uh, there's there's various solutions on the market. There's companies like um, Affinda and TextKernel that do resume parsing, but their solutions actually don't work very well in certain ways that we are, we've been able to quickly exceed using these new models. 
Um, the other reason that we think this is the right time for a product like this is that the hiring market is very inefficient. It's increasingly driven by fragmentation and misaligned incentives. I can talk more about that in the Q&A if, if there's interest there. Um, and we do think that consolidation is going to happen and that it's going to be driven uh, in large part by uh, better use of data. Okay, so how big is this problem? Well, we estimate that 500 million professional job applications are submitted in the US each month. Um, there's a little explanation there, so you can check my map if you want. That's a, that's a pretty big number though. Um, this problem manifests in various ways. So it creates time and staff costs. So if you have hiring managers doing this, they're doing this instead of other important work that they can do. If you have a recruiting team, you might need to staff it with a lot of people to get through all the applications if you have a, a large uh, company that you're, that you're uh, working with. Um, people experience pain. They don't like doing this. I mean, I guess uh, there's no accounting for taste, but most people that I've talked to do not like this. It's not their favorite task at work. Uh, there's also quality and bias issues, and this gets to, you know, it's, it's hard. Um, there's a lot of signals. There's a lot of synthesis that goes into making these decisions. And uh, mistakes are costly. You might end up having an interview with someone that you could have rejected uh, at the application stage. Or you might miss someone that would be a really great candidate because you, you just, it's, there's 300 applications and you don't have time to go through them and spend a lot of time on each one. And also, uh, we found that this takes a long time. So it's a common practice to review weekly because no one likes doing this and various other reasons, um, but that can create a lot of delay in filling a role. And we have a, a little white paper on that if there's interest in that. Move to the next slide. Okay, so here's our solution. So on the left there, you can see uh, a resume. This is what, what typically comes in. It's a more or less a piece of paper that's been digitized. And what step one here is we can take this unstructured data, extract it into a structured format, and then use it to render something that looks really nice. Like hopefully that looks at least decent. Uh, on the right there, that works on a phone. So uh, you can imagine what the thing on the left would look like on your phone. Some of you have probably seen what that looks like on your phone. It's not great. Um, once we have the data in a structured form, there's all sorts of things we can do with it. So we can support things like comparisons between candidates not just between individual candidates, but also between an individual and say a composite of a group of candidates or even a group of current employees. Uh, we can bring in internal and external context. So maybe there's a company that you don't know about on the resume. You can uh, tap it and see well, what is that company? Is it public? Is it a startup? What is this thing? And then of course, there's automation. In talking to people, we know they really want uh, the help machine help doing this task for them. This is, a, this is not a task that people want to do, um, but this is something that we'll, we'll sort of build in a way that uh, people stay in control. So there's, we'll, we'll explain the recommendations, explain the automations, and everything will be revisable. And we'll build it in a way where it integrates with any ATS. These are application tracking systems, for those who may not be familiar with those. Um, and we also uh, will build an integration that works about any ATS that we know. And here are a couple more screens. Uh, these are showing uh, the key indicators of this person that's uh, fictional. Um, but uh, so the idea here is the information that's sort of buried in many different signals in the resume can be surfaced and sort of synthesized for you once we uh, have, have built this out to a uh, sufficient level. Okay, so where are we currently? Uh, we've we been, yeah. Five minutes, unfortunately. Okay. All right. So before we go move the Q and A, let's stand there for the presentation on the clock. So where are you currently? <laughs> Great question. Great question. Where Where are we currently? So, um, we we've conducted uh, some, a fair number of interviews, more than ten, uh, conducted with hiring managers, talent leads. Uh, we have gone pretty far validating the problem. I think we've, uh, sir. Yeah, I'm going to blow here. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I'm trying to try to see anything else. Um, we have a working prototype. So those screenshots that you saw are from an actual working application. A couple of things have been fake, but the design is real. The parsing is real. We can take uh, a resume and uh, 
parse it into the format that you saw. We can render it in a way that looks nice on mobile, just like you saw. And we have built uh, basic email ingestion uploading. We're getting feedback on, on this sort of early uh, prototype. And then, uh, yeah, it's just, this is not really answering your question, but we do think there's a large opportunity here in the order of $100 million a month based on this, this estimate and the volume of applications. Other questions? Yes. I don't quite understand what you mean by the large basis model. Uh, so the, that's, they've been popularized by uh, ChatGPT and OpenAI. So what, what they actually do, the main thing that they do is completion. So given a set of text, they will sort of predict what comes next, but you can wrangle them into doing other things. And one of the things that you can wrangle them into doing, it turns out, is structuring unstructured data. And especially in combination with other techniques, other machine learning techniques and traditional techniques. So there's, um, and we're, we're exploring these. So there's, there's a technique called uh, named entity recognition. It's another machine learning technique. And by combining these things together, you can really quickly exceed what traditional, even machine learning based approaches can do. And the, the basic reason for that is that they bring so much context from outside of the information that you give it, that it can, it can, it can, I mean, it doesn't really understand, but it can predict how things should be, I mean, very accurately, as I'm sure everyone's probably played with these things, right? but that's, that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. There's, I mean, you can hire for lots of different things, lots of different industries. What do you think is really important right now? Is there like a focus with software developers, someone who's doing AI? Like, do you kind of a lot, you have you done a little bit more software discovery to kind of figure out where might you start? Where is the biggest need? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, uh, the, the natural place for us to start, uh, given our team, is in technology. Um, that's where we have the most experience, the most connections, uh, where people are interested in adopting products like this. Uh, we've also found that there's some interest in the financial services industry because they, they just, um, maybe it's because we, they're, they're the ones that we've ended up talking with, uh, but it seems like there could be a, a particular need in that industry as well. But I would say first technology, secondarily financial services, and then we'll, we'll see beyond that. Yes. Um, how easy is it for the hiring Yes, uh, that's a good question. So. It should be uh, extremely easy. The only thing that they will need is to get an API key for their APS. Uh, there's a service that we're playing with called Merge.dev, which provides a universal API for uh, ATS integrations. And they have a nice interface for that. So it should be about as easy as just a few clicks, provided that they have the authority to issue that key. So it's, it's very, very simple. And then we'll just plug directly in. With no additional uh, work required. Yeah. Okay. So, what are your thoughts on the request for the moment? Now that you need to get a list of now because of the team, how do you Yes. Uh, okay. So, first question was about competitors. So, there's a company called our most direct competitor that I found, a company called ideal.com, which is it launched a long time ago. Uh, they, um, they, they were acquired by private equity a long time ago. They, they don't seem to have much market penetration. I've yet to meet anyone that uses them. Uh, and I've actually yet to meet any hiring manager, at least in, in my sort of circle, I'm sure that, that this is done, uh, that uses any kind of automation. Everyone that I've talked to is just looking, at the end of the day, they're looking at resumes. And, and I guess this, this gets to the second point about LinkedIn. Yes, there are like these easy apply methods. There's all there's all kinds of stuff that job boards are doing. Still, though, the most common way that people are applying to jobs is still this traditional application. I don't think that's changing anytime soon. And I think this has to do with the fragmentation that I mentioned. If you want to have access to the full market of jobs as a job seeker, you have to be doing this. Like maybe certain people can get away with going after some niche job board. But this is still the gold standard for how to get a job. And I don't think that's, I mean, I, it is a risk that somehow some job where will solve this. I mean, AngelList is another one that's uh, doing interesting things here, but um, applications, I don't think are going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, yes. Oh, I have one last question. So is this tied specifically to resumes written on PDFs, or could you consume the data from those data? 
Yes, uh, we can consume any data. Yeah, we can also consume things like application questions. So it's not it's not just it's not only limited to what's in the resume. The resume was kind of the, the hardest piece to crack here because it's so structured. Well, I think that's it for Q and A. We'll be hanging out afterwards. But right. the last question for you is: like, What's your ask? Ah, yes, that was on. Thank you. For uh, so we're looking for uh, customer introductions, love to talk to people who are involved in reviewing applications, or anyone responsible for hiring outcomes. Um, and we are also trying to raise uh, $500,000 for product development and to uh, help us find uh, product market fit. So thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. I'm going to put the stand on the X. Yeah. All right. So we have an X marks the spot for where we should be standing. Uh, let's thank uh, Aaron again for the his presentation. It was really great to learn about. Uh, it's partly one of the reasons why I don't hire from my company because I don't want to deal with looking at job applications, but maybe your product will change that for me. Uh, with that said, I'd like to bring up our second presenter here, Aubrey from Cultureverse. Ultraverse is using technology to expand opportunities to access and experience the work of artists, educators, students, and preservationists. Let's bring up Aubrey. Hi, everyone. Okay. Um, I am going to hold this close because I imagine this is for the people on Zoom. Hopefully, they can hear me. Um, but can you all hear me if I just speak loud? Okay. Um, I was a drum major, and I think partly they chose me because I'm just loud um, and they could hear me. Um, so I, my name is Aubrey Martinson. I am the executive director of a 501c3 nonprofit called Cultureverse. We were formed about a little over a year and a half ago. Oh, I'm not on the X. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so year and a half old, um, and we've been doing a lot of stuff. And some of that, it's it's wide and it's varied, and it's hard to really package it all into one thing. So I imagine you'll have questions. This is a lot easier to show than tell, but I'm gonna tell you about it. So we are an organization whose goal is to link artists with interesting technology. Um, we um, we serve the creators and keepers of art, culture, and knowledge is what we like to say. And we do that by really bringing people together to learn um, how to tell their story using interesting tech. And I like to say that we're dreamers and doers and we are intrepid explorers. And one of the, I think the fine, when, one of the reasons I put this slide in front, normally I don't like to put you know, myself front, but the people of our organization really are, um, and actually Ramin is here too, Ramin is back there holding a camera. Um, and also Hava. <clears throat> Yeah, and I have a couple of project partners here too, but the people are really the most important thing to the organization, um, and it's the way we work. We have a lot of fun, and we are very curious, and we love exploring, and when we connect with one of our partners, um, that's really where all the magic happens, is in the exploration and finding that story and figuring out how to use the technology to tell it. And we like to do what we call joyful experimentation or joyful exploration. Um, this really is part of that process and how we work and what we do. And we really want to be a resource um, for artists and organizations who are looking to share their stories. And really, it's all about empowerment, right? We have a lot of everybody has a story to tell, but we are not always skilled on our own um, telling that story. So part of our value is really the, um, the experience that we bring people through as well as the tech that we have. So basically what we do is we have a lot of stuff. We've got a bunch of 3D scanners. Um, we have people who know how to use them and we have the storytelling process and then we bring things together. So we can scan people, we can scan places, we can scan objects and we bring them all together in a a platform called Saganworks, which is an immersive 3D uh, space. Uh, essentially, think of it like a virtual gallery, but it can really be for anything. Um, <clears throat> and we have everything from project management, design thinking, content, content strategy, and of course, uh, the software and tech uh, knowledge as well. 
Um, this is just a little bit of how we um, how we work with our partners because we know it doesn't really just start and end with the project. We really think of it as an ecosystem. And so these are just some of the components of that ecosystem. So I've got a couple examples. Um, I'm sorry, I, I prioritized family time in Austin this weekend over pulling up some super great photos. So thank you, Ramin, for adding the photos this week, um, just today, because that's how I roll. Um, <clears throat> so what we've done, we've done a lot of different things. So the, the eyeball at the bottom, this is Iro. This was a project for Art Prize. We worked with Noah Kaplan and we essentially brought his vision to life. Um, it was an interactive sculpture and he handled the building part of it and we took his dream and we made it interactive. Um, Ramin, my uh, coworker, Matt Grossman, Shanley Carlton, we did everything from the video um, to the programming, the interactivity, the building the web, um, um, the web interface, the front end. Um, and it was in Art Prize and we had a lot of interaction with it from all over the world because you could experience it from anywhere via the web app or you could experience it in person in Grand Rapids. Um, that marionette there, we're scanning um, a collection of marionettes in the basement of Celine City Hall. People cannot access, access these marionettes which were donated to Celine City Hall or the city of Celine, I'm sorry. So we're, we're scanning them and we're placing them inside of a virtual gallery so that anybody can uh, explore these uh, anytime. And we also have really good parties. Petal Sandcastle uh, is here with us tonight and um, did a project with us uh, called Say Yes Fest and it lasted two months. And this was um, less tech, but more experiential. We have a space on Main Street um, and we were able to share a space with Petal so that they could throw some really amazing parties like silent discos um, last year. So um, I know this is like super brief and I know that this probably um, brings more questions than answers. But what we're looking for as an organization, we're looking for project partners. So these would be um, artists who whose work deserves to be seen. Um, maybe they're um, super great with social media already. Maybe they've got their website, but they're looking for a more immersive way to share their work. And that would be where we come in. They could also be people who just have really big wacky ideas using technology because we love that stuff too. We love taking a really complicated problem breaking it into steps, and then making something happen. Um, we're also looking for strategic partners. So people who um, have technology that could be utilized by artists um, or have the skills necessary to utilize some of the tech we have. Like I said, we've got a lot of 3D scanners. We have a virtual uh, immersive gallery software that we use. Um, but what else is out there? You know, I was an art major. So uh, actually an art and English double major at a liberal arts college. So I don't really have a lot of tech experience except for the BBS my brother and I ran in 1994. Um, I mean, you know, and just being a user of tech um, from my high school days. Uh, so, so this is all really like new for me. Um, I just sort of got dropped into this world and I'm off and running. Um, but so we're looking for strategic partners who can inform us too, right? Um, this landscape is vast, it is broad, and you all know way more collectively than any single one of us knows. And that's why we really, we have a very porous organization. We love getting information from other people. We love sharing information in return. And we're looking for funding partners. Um, so we have a significant um, contributor uh, who's funding us for several years. And uh, I am looking to increase that funding uh, over the next 10 years um, so that we can be sustainable. Right now we're an idea, right? We're a dream. And I would love more than anything for us for this to be a sustainable reality where we can help artists share their voices anywhere, anytime. That's it. Okay, good. Any thoughts about getting into advertising? Advertising? Hmm. Tell me what you mean by that. Uh, I'm, I'm in tech, right? So uh, tech complex problems. I can see, you know, your process of applied to presenting solutions in a simple manner, in an immersive fashion, um, with your approach. I think that could be interesting. Hmm. You know, honestly, I this this I honestly think our team could pretty much do anything. We have an amazing, sorry, I'm not on the X anymore. 
Um, yeah, it's just the way we can come together, we describe it like Voltron, you know, or like individually, we're all these like amazingly powerful little kitty cats that can run around and then together we're just like this massive machine uh, that I guess does good. I can't remember what Voltron does, but but yeah, no, this is, that's interesting. Thank you. Do you have questions? Uh, Sorry. Yeah, I was just curious if you could walk us through like a prototypical sort of experience, like a common client or partner that you have and like what that engagement looks like. Yeah, so um, I don't know if I included, oh, you know what? I deleted that slide because I was like, nobody's gonna really wanna know that. But we really don't have a typical thing that we do. And it's because we work with individuals. Um, we are going to start scaling to, you know, work with, um, you know, the multitudes of people who might want to engage in the virtual gallery software, because that's a big possibility where we don't really have to interact with people one on one. But as we're starting, we really do work one on one with people. And so that means like everything looks very different. Um, and we're beginning to sort of standardize that process, which essentially is, you know, the, the uh, essential product development stage where we're, you know, doing discovery. Um, then we move into design, then we do, you know, the, the rest of it. So it's, um, it really is hard to say, yeah, because we do it differently every time. But it really depends on the artist. Essentially, it's, we have these cool tools, what do you want to do with it? And then we figure out if that's feasible, and then we make it happen. Right. So what comes next? So the, the question was like, what happens after we work with an artist? Are we just done? And it's hard to say that we can't really just be done because we're, relationships are so important to us as an organization that we typically will keep working with people um, in some shape or form. Um, the, the end result to some of our project, projects is just a virtual space, which the artists would embed into their um, website. And um, what we're adding to our programming this year is, uh, I'm sorry, adding to our organization this year is our uh, learning phase, which, you know, we put this out into the world. And what does it matter, right? We can make a virtual space, but are people looking at it? Are they feeling something when they look at it? And if so, is it a good thing, right? Are they engaging with the art? Are they interested, right? And, um, you know, just because we're sharing something in a new way, it doesn't mean people want to consume it in a new way. And that's something that we're, we're really looking into and wanting to learn a lot about. Um, we do, you know, with, um, gosh, yeah, we do a lot of projects. Like I can, each of these folks, I, I can't really say there's an end to any of these projects because something else interesting will come along, which is, you know, we want to work with a lot of people. And so, you know, doing, building relationships and working with a lot of people feel uh, in conflict a bit um, because, you know, next, you know, but um, yeah, so if that makes any sense. Yeah, I want to Sure. There are a lot of enough Egyptian that are delivered. Where do you differentiate what is going to happen this? Why you not in the how do you differentiate Yeah, so, and you mean like in a virtual space? Yeah, I mean, any space. In any space, I, 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 why? Okay, so, <clears throat> I'm sorry, excuse me. One of the reasons is that in the world, there's more art than walls, and the software we use, because it's right there, um, the software we use provides infinite walls, right? Like, you could make as many galleries as you want. Like, let's say you've got a million artworks, put them all up. There's nobody to tell you no. And so that's one of the beautiful things about a virtual space that's free and accessible to anybody, is that nobody's telling you, no, you can't display your artwork and how to do it, right? We help artists share their stories, but anybody can use this anytime. They don't need us as an intermediary to help them. Um, if anybody wants to put up an art, you know, artworks, um, they can do it now. The platform we use, um, it's called Saganworks and you can find it at saganworks.com. Um, and, you know, the other reason is uh, we're not a traditional gallery. We're not necessarily focused on sales. We're focused on exposure, and we're exposed and we're fo we're focused on exploration too. I think that's time for Q and A. Are we being asked with it? Thank you.
Oh, I got it. Yeah, here you go. I was just like, it's all good. Wildly. Okay. All right. Uh, well, let's give uh, Aubrey and Colterverse another round of applause. We're really um, And with that, we get rid of our last presenter of the evening uh, from Stork. We have Omed. Stork is a shopping platform that allows shoppers to get same day delivery and returns to and from their doorstep from boutiques in their area. So with that introduction, I'll introduce, I'll bring up Omed over here. Well, uh, testing. Hi everybody, my name is Omed Jaxi. I am the co-founder and CEO of Stork. Stork is a shopping app that allows users to get uh, same day deliveries and returns from boutiques in their area. Um, uh, so really what you need to look at here is uh, 160,000 boutiques across the United States generated $22.4 billion in uh, 2022. Um, the current state is that there's an estimated monetary value uh, decline of uh, $425 million from 2021 to 2022 in the boutique market. Um, what's the problem? The problem is boutique owners have either four websites no websites, uh, low ad spend, or no understanding of CEO or SEO. Um, shoppers' uh, problem is that they must go in store if they want something same day. Um, or if they're shopping online, they're giving three to seven business day wait time. Um, and then to find out the clothes possibly do not fit. Uh, so, what's the solution? So, we created a platform for boutique owners to sell uh, their products to their city and surrounding cities. Um, and then we give shoppers that convenience aspect of receiving their clothes same day and being able to send them back same day. Um, what's our business model? We get 18% of all products sold on our platform. Uh, we have a store plus membership where uh, shoppers uh, can pay $15 a month for added features. Uh, we charge $45 to $250 per month on uh, boutique premium features that will help sell their products faster. Um, and then we get digital ad ads spend as well on our platform. Um, traction, we have two boutiques that are interested in testing with us. Uh, Laurel and Jack, for example, has five locations across uh, Michigan. Um, they're very, very successful. Uh, this has been one touch to get Laurel and Jack on, on, on our platform. I uh, just called into Laurel and Jack. Uh, she said to speak to the manager. Uh, manager forwards me over to the owner. Owner responds, hey, we're interested. What are next steps? I can send you guys an email if you're interested in seeing that. Um, competition landscape. All you really need to know is that Stork uh, is one of one. We're the only ones that are uh, you know, offering same day delivery for uh, small brands, everybody else is focused on big brands uh, and getting their products uh, through standard de standard delivery. Uh, except for Etsy, there's folks on small brands too for standard delivery. Um, the market, so $22.4 billion market, we're interested in capturing just 1% over the next three years. Very, very doable. Um, our acquisition strategy, we're trying to get 300 boutiques by the end of this year, uh, 3,000 boutiques by the end of next year, 30,000 boutiques by the end of 2025, uh, again, we're starting with the Midwest, going to the tri-state area, and then the rest of the U.S. Uh, how we're going to do this, we have trained sales teams that, we're gonna, that are going to onboard boutiques. We're going to do strategic partnerships with fashion events and, uh, you know, other other fashion events. And, and uh, yeah. <laughs> and then, um, so the big number to look at here is that big billion-dollar mark at 2027. Uh, we'll be seeing a billion dollars in 2027. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, very doable companies like um, Anchor uh, Store, for example, uh, saw a $2 billion valuation uh, in two years. We're, we're seeing a $10 billion valuation in five years, and you can look them up if you're wondering why I'm bringing them up. Um, dashboard, this is everything we've done to date and everything we will continue to do uh, moving forward. Uh, market, uh, you know, I've done market research, uh, validated the problem, built out the app, pushed it to the app, sort of run on a technical co-founder at the end of the year. Um, and then he hired out our first uh, developer based out in India, and then he's managing them um, moving forward. Um, me and my co-founder here, uh, this guy's been doing 20, he's been uh, consulting for 20 years in, the, in this space. 
um, and he's, he's very sharp. Um, I've been doing sales for the last seven years. I always wanted to be a tech founder here, and here we are today. Uh, funding, we're looking up to, we're looking for up to 3 million in funding. Um, this is what our app looks like right now. Customer app, driver app. You can look at the uh, app store right now. You can you can download them. Uh, the, and but we're just you know we're going through uh, bug fixes right now, so you guys know just bear that in mind. That's the boutique portal. Uh, this is what the app will look like after we revamp it. This is just a quick wireframe we put together. We paid someone like forty bucks to do it. They finished it in a couple hours. Uh, and yeah, we we know how to stretch a dollar. So uh, and yeah, that's it. Thank you guys. Uh, seeking some some funding. <laughs> Yeah, you. Yeah, we're using, I mean, how does this work? We're using for driver, what are you, is it you and your co pilot right now that are going to pick up close to the boutique and drop off to somebody? Um, how far is your radius? Sure. Um, if you're, if you guys are the ones dropping off, you guys also want to pick it up. Um, no offense, because I mean, but Amazon has all those trucks, right? What do you got right now? You know what? A couple of, a couple of kids, uh, uh, um, came by my house and, and cleaned up the uh, the leaves uh, a few weeks ago, and, and I told them, you know, when, when you guys are ready, you guys can come and, and drive for me. So a couple of 16-year-old kids is all I got right now, but uh, we'll figure that out with time. Uh, during the testing phase, yeah, we'll just, you know, we'll take it take it one step at a time. Yeah. I'm assuming it can work kind of like a DoorDash delivery. I mean, but for clothing. Yeah. Actually, yeah, actually. yeah. Yeah, essentially we're DoorDash for, for, for clothing. Um, what you'll notice is if you go on like DoorDash, you go on Uber Eats, you go on like uh, all these these big companies, you'll see you'll see companies like um, like Dollar General or uh, you'll see Meyer or Target on their app, but you won't see you, you won't see Laurel and Jack, you won't see all these other their clothing brands. And a lot of the, the reason is um, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but my uh, Nike pulls out of Meyer uh, not long ago, and the reason they did that is because they don't want to be seen with your eggs or with your milk. Like you don't want to like if I'm a clothing brand and and you know, I'm selling, I'm selling my, my merchandise. I don't want to be on a platform called Uber Eats. I don't want somebody to get my clothing where they can get their hamburger. So yeah, we're it's strictly for apparel. And then over time, you know, once we handle the logistics things, because we do want to hand, we want to handle the entire logistic uh, side of things. So that'll be an entire business in and of itself. Once we, once we get that sorted out. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, so I find your from, I that's based off of sale price and profit. Yeah, so uh, 18%, so these boutiques, um, these boutiques are seeing a 50% profit margin. So if I wanted to sell this shirt right here in, in, a, in a boutique that, that handles a bunch of other brands, uh, they have a, anywhere from a 35 to a, a, even a 60% profit margin, right? So they're, they're buying my shirt for like 10 bucks, they're selling it for 35 bucks, right? Uh, so we're we're offering this at, at 18 percent we feel like it's a fair fair price it's kind of it, it's similar to what we've researched in the market what, what other companies are are taking uh amazon takes 50 percent, for example uh and so that's how we came up with and that'll be a gradual gradual change so first year we're taking nine percent second year we're, we're up in that and third year it's going to be third year and on it's going to be 18 percent i'd be curious you know actually yeah, so you're talking about like a markup on Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you for bringing. <laughs> yes, sir. How do you think about your unit economics? My unit economics. Sorry. Can you can you elaborate? Uh, that basically uh, some good, you know, like maybe a monthly sale from the seat for daily sale or for item average item sale. How much could it cost you to deliver? What the return rate going to be? What that going to cost you? So what's the basic cost structure? That's a great question. Um, so in the testing phase, I mean, we're, we're going to, those are a lot of questions that are, that are going to be answered in the testing phase. Um, so the, the, the person that's purchasing the product is going to be paying for the delivery. Um, I just, I, I, I don't have, a, I don't have uh, numbers for you. Sorry. About that. Still working it out. 
please. So I'm curious, because I'm working with the small retail shops and with, you know, very injury that affects the patio. Sure. Um, and one thing that's always difficult is seeing the inventory estimates, right? It's not connected to a point of sale system. Um, so I'm just wondering how great question so we're gonna we're that's something we're working on as well starting out we are it is going to be a manual process of uploading all your all your products to the store and then over time we want to we want to integrate with whatever like if they're using shopify or, or whatever else they're using we want to integrate with those those tools and, and make it so it's it's all in just you know one one location well, good question sure. this is on behalf of mother or she's asking me to ask you this question um, love mother with all of these like rapid who get your stuff seven miles across town um, is the sort of carbon footprint and a lot of things. I'm just thinking, um, is there like a minimum someone has to buy? Um, kind of, are you gonna be using electrical cars? Like, is there a certain distance that drivers will drop a blouse and then return a blouse? Yeah, um, yeah. that's a great question. So um, yes, there will be minimums. Um, and then as far as like, um, like how we can, how we're gonna solve for that issue, um, driver, so a shopper, for example, can shop multiple stores on, on, on one delivery, and then we're going to group different deliveries. So let's say three people living within the same radius, um, happen to shop, uh, three different boutiques on the same day. We'll figure out a way to get one driver to go to three different locations within a, a certain radius and drop off multiple orders in another certain, certain radius, if that makes sense. Yes. So you didn't mention that uh, the shopper is going to pay the delivery yeah. fee. Then why are you restricting, restricting with a minimum order, right? So, um. Well, they would pay. They would be paying the delivery fee. Um. But still, again, uh, what it would, what was mentioned over here uh, is we are we are conscious about you know carbon footprint. Um. And so, uh, over time, you know. It, it, one shirt and you know 30 miles 30 minutes away um would work wouldn't work if there's no other orders it's something we're still playing with i mean the delivery process is still very very new to us but um we'll just see how how it, how it plays out uh, i don't go to the street for the uh, i go for the experience um, sure for me. sure so i think the better idea would be to go to that store and have an experience and then show the event which is not there, just go to our whole And yeah. then, uh, all yeah, no, that's a, that's a great concern. Um, you know, so everyone, I get the uh, uh, thing I get all the time is I, I go to the big uh, at top near my store for the experience. Right. Fair enough, fair enough. Okay, what if you could have multiple boutiques in one in one location right on your phone though, and you can just shop? Four or five, six of them, and get them all to your door same day. Try them on, send them right back. So what I try to say is, look the other way around. That's a great experience too, I think. No, I think you go to the boutique for the shopping experience, sure. and then you can uh, drive it and have an internet, and then you can order uh, the inventory. Sure, sure. I see what you're saying. All right, so let's give our uh, presenters a round, another round of applause. All three of them. So with that said, we're going to move into our community announcement section. So again, as I said, if you have anything you want to announce, like jobs or you have meet up your hosting, um, I'll announce a couple things. So I'll announce next month's uh, HNU Tech. It'll be on March 21st. So if you enjoyed this, uh, please do come back and enjoy the fun. Uh, connected to that, as I mentioned earlier, this will be my last time hosting 18 New Tech. I'd like to bring up the co-hosts who will be taking over. I'm really excited to see what they, they do with 18 New Tech and continue to have it continue to flourish. Uh, so I'd like to bring up Margarita, Michael, and Jonah. So we just introduce them real quickly. Um, they can say a quick couple of words if they want to as well, but give like these, these guys a hand of a round of applause for continuing to do this. Uh, 
I don't like something. I mean, I mean, really, what we need to do is give him a round of applause. For the fantastic job of enjoying through the pandemic. Like, I, I think that's really admirable. I think he's done a, a fantastic job. Squeeze in. If only Ron asks. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, thank you everybody uh, for this. Uh, when Hein said last month, um, you know, I don't know that he expected to get quick answers, uh, but within 24 hours, I was on board. I asked Jonah, and Jonah's like, I want to do it. And I mean, like, maybe like 24 hours after that, Margaret was like, Well, I want to do it too. Uh, so <laughs> it's a community effort. It is. Yeah, that's how you need three people to replace one. Um, Good job, I guess. Yeah. We have a lot of we have a lot of ideas, a lot of things that we want to see uh, A2 New Tech grow and become. Um, one of them you've already witnessed here today. We changed the the setup of the room. Uh, the reason we changed the setup of the room um, is Venue 4M is providing this great space to us, free of charge. And one of the things we'd like to do is say, like, hey, we want to provide a little bit of table service. Uh, if you guys, I don't know how many people have ordered a drink. No one's under an obligation to order a drink. But we would love for you, if you want to, to, to participate in that. Um, you know, we've had some ideas. We we might look at other venues. We might. Uh, We're going to do lots of customer discovery. Customer discovery. Jeff wants, wants us to take it into the dining room, which we would love to do. Um, but we would love for you guys to, to you know, to participate here uh, for more than just 6.30 to 7.30. Um, we're looking at a sponsor to buy happy hour uh, from five o'clock to six o'clock. So you guys would not have to pay for your drinks. Um, we think very confident we don't have it by March. We'll have a sponsor take care of a whole happy hour from April through the rest of the year. Uh, so that's something to look forward to. We've got some couple other ideas, but we are very open to any ideas that you guys have because uh, we want to make this more about the entire community. There's about 50 of you here. Our goal is within six months to have 250 people here. Uh, he's not going to get 250. Not in here. Not in here. No. But if we have 250 people, they will give us the dining room. So um, that's going to be our goal. So we're open to your suggestions on how to make that happen. So. Goals set aside. It's about quality. What we br what we bring, the network that we start grooming here. I mean, it all starts with you too. So. Tell your friends, bring your mom if you need to, and all that other stuff. But it's it's really about community love and trying to give back and really grow a lot of that and bring it back. It, it was a great, huge endeavor before we started, and definitely the pandemic. But um, we're generally trying to bring it back. So help us do that. Yeah, sorry. One quick thing too. I mean, if you guys look through the logs and Heinz shared all the logs with us, there are some incredible companies who have come through A2 New Tech. Um, stock X pitched here. Um, you know, Ansys, a $6 billion company, came through A2 New Tech. Okay, so uh, the three that pitched here today, um, you know, you guys have great opportunities to grow, and there have been some huge successful ones. You had a lot of questions thrown at you, you didn't know the answers to. That's absolutely okay. The point was to get those questions because you're going to go back to the drawing board and say, I got to answer that, I got to answer that, I got to answer that. If I can't answer these questions, I don't have a business. But once you figured out those answers, you're going to have a far better business than you have right now. And so I think that is critical. And that's what this community can provide. That was awesome to hear that much interaction. So, um, yeah, take that. Don't take that as like, oh, shit, like I'm in trouble. Take that as like, this community just gave me a lot of good feedback that I can use as I go build something better. But yeah. you know, And if you've got other ideas, you've got friends. Like, we're trying to help cultivate a lot of that, too, to support, to give it back. Anything else? No. You guys have any questions? Any other community announcements? I don't want to make them. <laughs> <laughs> the mic. Um, hi, I'm Christy. I am an ed tech founder and I am building something that is incredibly technical. Um, it's a social mission. I am building a set of letter blocks that talks and engages with very young children, in particular impoverished kids who are a year to two years behind in language and cognitive development when they reach kindergarten. Um, a lot of well-intentioned people in the K-12 sector try to help the kids, but the return on investment is really critical 
in the first few years of life. So I'm building something that supports these kids, supports their families, and also if anyone is an expert in machine learning, artificial intelligence, my long-term social impact vision is to do longitudinal analysis, pulling data from the device and being able to diagnose neurodevelopmental disorders about a year and a half prior to the current um, diagnostic age. Um, and I'm a behavioral scientist and an education researcher. So this isn't just a dream, but it's all empirically validated. I just need um, people who are technical. So if you are maybe my future CTO, come and drink with me. And um, if you're a machine learning person or if you know of anybody, I would really um, just love some connection in the area. Thank you. Other announcements? Yeah. My name is Michael Borgolthas. I'm the CEO and founder of Fusaware. Fusaware meaning functional safety hardware and software. I'm on the X. Okay. Okay. And on the microphone, apparently. Um, founded locally here in Michigan, have since, uh, let's say, branched out into a few states. We've got quite a bit of traction. We're probably a little bit farther along than the typical startup that's investing in door pitching here. Um, we more or less at this point help out the automotive industry with their hardware electronics, specifically in the verification phase. So we've already got quite a few customers. We're already in the millions of dollars of revenue and we're growing our team. I would say the most urgent would be in the cloud networking side. So cloud engineers, number one, backend engineers, number two, and then obviously always a spot in our heart for the uh, hardware folks. So if you're interested or in any of those domains, please feel free to tap my shoulder. Anyone else? It's really great. Um, this is just an offer to everyone. Not even go up there, but I don't have to go up there. This is just an offer to everyone. Um, I can feel the genius, the left brain, sort of colossal yes of this room. Um, and so I just want to offer everyone, um, I think especially yes, if not because downtown, to tap into that right side um, brain, tap into that sort of like colorful, maybe non-linear, more circular, um, just way of thinking about whatever you're doing um, with your practices, but also just as a human. Um, so if you're interested in tapping into your inner child or finding a way to add some color and light and quantum entangled connection to your uh, stuff. Um, express your yes. Thank you. Okay, I'm on the X. Uh, I just want to say hi. I'm new here. Um, I just moved from Philly the two and a half months ago now. Um, and I still have my job in Philly, so I'm working remotely. Um, and starting to feel like it might be nice to not work remotely. And I think I might be the only person in the world that thinks that right now. Um, so uh, sort of tentatively interested in some, some either hybrid or like actual onsite uh, stuff in Ann Arbor. Um, also, my name, <laughs> also, my name is Abner. Um, hi, I <laughs> probably should have started my name. Um, I do, uh, right now, I, I don't know if I should say who I work for or not, but uh, I do some combination of data analysis and data science somewhere like in between, maybe the center of that Venn diagram. Um, yeah, I got you. Yeah, great. Yeah, um, also a little bit of machine learning. So uh, maybe we'll chat. Um, but yeah, just wanted to say hello um, and great to be here. And thanks for making sure this thing exists uh, so I can meet some folks. Well, thank you. Oh. Well, I think that's a perfect segue. It's time to meet some folks. So thanks everybody for coming tonight. Uh, feel free to hang around, uh, grab a drink to support the venue here. And thank you all for coming and see you all next month on the 21st. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 